All right, everybody, welcome. Here's a, another video coming to you. It's only about eight slides, but hopefully you have your composition book out and ready if you are a, a good note taker. Uh, let's start with thinking like a scientist. So what, what you can't see, what got cut off on your screen is what attitudes help you think scientifically. And really attitude is everything in life. And so it certainly applies to the science classroom. Atti attitude is a state of mind. What does that mean? It means you choose your attitude. So having a good one means that your actions reflect having a, an open state of mind and a positive attitude. In talking about scientists, they possess certain important attitudes. They're curious, they're honest, they're creative, they have open minds, but they're also skeptics, and we'll talk about what a skeptic is. They have good ethics and are aware of any bias they might bring to their investigation. Okay, let's talk about curiosity. Scientists naturally have to be curious. They want to investigate things that interest them. Why is the sky blue? Why does it rain? Uh, what makes, uh, you know, how do hurricanes form? What systems can we develop to warn people of hurricanes? That's all stems from curiosity. Honesty. This is really important, especially for you guys. You guys always want to do a good job, and I, I certainly appreciate that. So you'll make predictions or you'll make a hypothesis, and then you'll do an experiment, and it's not always turning out the way you thought it would. And you want to go back and maybe change data or change your hypothesis, but you can't. Um, because in science, the really awesome thing is even if you're wrong, that teach you teaches you a lot. It's okay for your hypothesis or your prediction to be wrong. You have to be honest and you have to report your results even if they go against what you initially thought. Lastly, and I would probably say the most important thing is creativity. Being creative is huge in science. Why? Because we have to apply these problem solving skills to come up with new ways to study things or find solutions. If people weren't creative, we would still be um, hunters and wearing bear skins. We wouldn't have civilizations. We wouldn't be the world we are today because people would have just been happy with what, they, what, with what they've always been doing. Instead, it took really brave people to go, hmm, I don't want to lug um, these stones up the hill. Maybe if I invent you know, something round that can help me, you know, build a cart to lug my things up the hill, that's going to make it easier for me. So it was always people that had innovative and creative ideas that led the way for our civilization to become what it has. All right, open-mindedness and skepticism. Scientists need to be open-minded. That means that you're capable of accepting new and different ideas, even if they go against what you might have previously thought. Um, so I'm not saying you always have to agree with things, but you should be open-minded about them. Um, however, being open-minded means you should also be skeptic, skeptic of things. To be a skeptic means you have a little bit of doubt. You're not going to believe everything you hear, see, read. This is certainly true of the internet. My goodness, there's so much nonsense out there. You have to be able to sift through it. And if you want to know if it's true or not in science, a lot of the times, um, that's where investigations come from. Well, they say this happens, you know, maybe when uh, Isaac Newton wrote his paper on the theory of gravity um, and, and, you know, the apple falling on his head, well, people probably tested that and then it started to make sense to them. Well, we accept that today is true. If you drop something, it's going to fall to the ground eventually. But having an attitude of skepticism is a healthy, healthy trait to have in science. Ethics. Ethics really replies to your whole life. This is your conscience. This is what um, allows you to know right from wrong. Um, so in science, what this applies to is how we're going to study things. Excuse me. We want, might want to know how a certain drug affects children born with, with a hydrocephaly, which is water on the brain. We're not going to go and directly uh, test children with hydrocephaly because that's ethically wrong. We, we don't want to use humans as test subjects. We even are super careful in using animals because we don't want to have a negative effect on the people and the environment in which we live in. So scientists have to follow an ethical code, and they have to question themselves. Could this hurt other people, animals? Could it hurt the environment around me? So they have to really weigh the pros and cons of doing things to make sure they're uh, ethically okay. 
All right, awareness of bias. There's this is huge. Let's talk about what bias is. First of all, bias is what um, the just the general term is what scientists expect to find. So um, if I go into a an experiment and I expect something to happen, that is my bias. So that sometimes can influence what I see, touch, smell, taste, hear, and how I interpret those observations. So there's three different kinds of bias. The first one is personal bias, and this comes from a person's likes or dislikes. How can this affect a scientific investigation? And this is really easy. So suppose I'm doing a study and I want to know, um, does listening to country music make you, make students study more efficiently? So maybe I'm not really into country music. Um, that would be my personal bias. That might influence maybe how I ask people questions. Oh, does, does country music make you study harder? And because they hear that negative tone in my voice, they might answer in another way. So we have to be really careful about our personal bias. Sec second is our cultural bias. Um, everybody grows up, even in America, we're in a melting pot. We grew up in a different culture. We have uh, different cultures uh, view things in a different way. Um, what's acceptable in one culture may not be acceptable in another. And we have to sh be sure we keep our bias out, again, of our investigations. The one that's probably the most prevalent in science is experimental bias. That is when we ex mistakenly design our experiment, and what happens is when we get our results, they're not really accurate because our experiment wasn't designed in that per in the right way. So, experimental bias happens quite a bit in science. That's why you hear one thing that says, "Oh, eating chocolate is good for you," and then you hear another another study that says eating chocolate is bad for you. It's because there's flaws in the design of the experiment. That is experimental bias. All right, scientific reasoning. This is pretty interesting. There's different ways, logical ways of thinking about things after we've uh, experienced them. So there's two types. There's objective reasoning. It means that you make decisions and draw conclusions based on available evidence. To be an objective reasoner, you must have an open mind. This is pretty rational thought. This is you are just making a decision based on evidence. Subjective reasoning is completely different. This is where your personal feelings influence your decisions or conclusions. And this is based on your emotions. So if you guessed it, the kind of uh, reasoning we really want to make sure we're using in science is objective reasoning. We want to have an open mind. We want to base our conclusions on the evidence that's available to us. All right, there's also two different types of uh, objective reasoning, and that's deductive and inductive reasoning. Deductive reasoning is starts by explaining things with a general idea and then applying the idea to a specific observation. So we start with information. If we look at the graphic at the bottom, we notice a pattern. We form a hypothesis. We test that hypothesis. We come up with a theory. Inductive reasoning is the exact different opposite. We start with a theory. And then we're going to form a hypothesis. Uh, we're going to test that hypothesis, make observations, and that either confirms or denies our theory. So deductive and inductive reasoning both have their place in scientific investigations. One starts where the other one leaves off. Lastly is faulty reasoning, and this, this unfortunately, again, happens in science way too much. This occurs when conclusions are drawn from too little data. We've not done enough trials. We haven't sampled enough people. We don't have enough information, but we still make, um, we make it, we draw a conclusion. Now, the problem is our conclusion is probably wrong because we don't have enough information. So if you look at the graphic, it's kind of funny. It says, scientists tested a frog. They cut its leg off, and they said, jump. The frog didn't jump. Scientists therefore concluded that when frogs lose their legs, they become deaf. It's funny. I mean, we know the frog didn't jump because he didn't have legs, but you could also draw the conclusion that they were deaf because they didn't hear the scientists say jump. So you have to be really careful about faulty reasoning, which means you, that's why we do lots of trials and experiments. We make sure we've covered all of our bases. All right, that's it for this lecture. Uh, I hope you guys have an awesome day.